Hello and thank you for joining us. The, the following video is an extract from one of a series of Academic Wednesday Worldwide webinars conceived and hosted by the Institute of Economic Affairs. In this video we hear from Fabio Rojas, who is Professor of Sociology at Indiana University and also a co-editor of Keck Contexts, Sociology for the Public, which is the official magazine of the American Sociological Association. And Fabio considers freedom is something we do together. And what he does is analyze freedom using the tools of cultural sociology. So thank you everybody for uh, appearing today. I know that we're in a time of public health crisis and a lot of personal stress. So I really do appreciate the fact that you've taken the time uh, to come to this talk and to share this, these ideas with me. My name is Fabio Rojas. I teach sociology at Indiana University. I'm also one of the editors of Context Magazine, as I had uh, mentioned, uh, and that is available for free at context.org. Everything older than 12 months is not paywalled, and every new issue is free for 30 days, so please check that out. So the title of my talk is Freedom is Something That We Do Together. Freedom is Something We Do Together. And the basic idea of freedom is something we do together is that you can use the tools, the ideas of so cultural sociology to explain what freedom is and where tolerance comes from. So I'm gonna outline the talk a little bit. Uh, first, we're gonna start with uh, Robinson Crusoe, a very well-known figure in social and moral philosophy. And I'm gonna use that book to motivate the basic idea of the talk, which is that freedom is not really about a piece of paper, it's not about a Magna Carta or a Bill of Rights, it's really about the community's tolerance for what you want to do, okay? Uh, after I motivate that basic point, then I'm going to slip into some philosophy, and I'm going to talk about something called the triadic view of freedom, which is uh, pretty simple. And then after I talk about that, I'll get into the sociology, where I'm going to talk about the way that communities develop tolerance. They develop beliefs or facts, social facts, about what they think the world is like. Uh, there's interpretations of facts, which people call framing, and there are interaction ritual chains, which are meetings or gatherings where people come together to describe what the facts are, how they're interpreted, and to tra transmit these facts into the future. And then if we're doing good on time, then I'll apply this general framework for thinking about freedom to academic speech disputes. So uh, let's start with Robinson Crusoe, a very uh, popular person in social and moral philosophy. If you're not familiar with Robinson Crusoe, or if you've never read the book or seen the movie, Robinson Crusoe is a tale of a young British man uh, from a wealthy family. He decides to leave home and he goes on a series of adventures. But the most important thing uh, for Robinson Crusoe is that he gets stuck on a deserted island. He, there's a shipwreck, you can see it in the uh, image on this uh, book cover. Um, there's a shipwreck and he's alone on the island. And most people will focus on the fact that he's alone, he has to uh, develop a sense of gratitude about what he has, about what he doesn't have, um, it tests his faith in God and so forth. But for me, what I think is really interesting about Robinson Crusoe is that when he's alone on the island by himself, freedom is not really an issue for him in the way we normally understand it. Uh, if he wants to say something, he can just say it. If he wants to build a house, he can just do it. Uh, nobody's there to stop him. There may be physical or biological constraints on what he can do, but in general, if he can do something physically, he can just do it. Um, but this stops being the case once he starts encountering other people on the island. He discovers first another native that he becomes friends with, and then later he discovers there are other tribes on the island, and eventually, spoilers, he gets off the island. And then there, there's also the question of how people treat him. So when he encounters these other natives, he discovers that they're, uh, that they're really uh, a warrior tribe, or there's actually multiple tribes. They have warfare against each other. They, they do horrible things to each other. So this raises the issue of, once I encounter other people, how are they gonna treat me? Will they leave me alone? Will they capture me? Will they do horrible things to me? And just to reinforce this point, I want all uh, the uh, viewers or listeners to uh, consider the Bill of Rights for Robinson Crusoe. Let's uh, pretend that Robinson Crusoe is on the beach and uh, there's an airplane that flies by and drops a flyer that has the Bill of Rights on it, or my, maybe he finds it etched on a piece of wood, like a piece of driftwood. Um, it's simply not a relevant thing for him. 
he would pick it up and say, what's the point? There's nobody to stop me from saying what I can say. I already have freedom of speech. Uh, this is not interesting to me. This is boring. What's the point of this? And that really simple thought experiment draws attention to the fact that freedom isn't really about what you can and can't do. It's really about what people will allow you to do. The Bill of Rights, the Magna Carta, all these instruments of protecting uh, rights and liberties are really about telling other people what they can't do to you rather than what you can do. Now, if you buy this general uh, thought experiment, uh, which argues that freedom is really about the encounter of the individual with the rest of society and a regulation of what society can do on you, you very naturally get to uh, what is called the triadic view of freedom. Uh, it sounds fancy, but it's actually a very straightforward idea um, put forth by uh, Oppenheim in 1961 and Gerald McCollum, the legal scholar in 1967. And they say, look at all these arguments about freedom. Uh, they argue about different things, positive rights, negative rights, maybe in the modern uh, term, we'd say capabilities. Uh, the philosophers in the audience can add their own um, elaborations. But uh, Oppenheim and McCollum say, okay, well, all these arguments about freedom revolve around three things. They revolve around, you need a person, an actor who can actually do stuff. Number two, you need some sort of option or possibility that you can take, right? And there has to be some set of constraints that you're talking about. And notice that in the Robinson Crusoe example, uh, at least when it comes to social aspects of freedom, that uh, you have the first two, but not the third. So Robinson Crusoe is your agent. He can do things or not do things, like he can choose to build a house or not, he can go fishing or not. But until there's somebody else to stop him, uh, there's really no constraint aside from biology or physics. So if you buy this argument that freedom is about these three things and that the kinds of freedoms that say classical liberals uh, and others uh, tend to think about, um, it's really the third point that draws our attention, which is there are constraints. And then if there are constraints, you can ask, where do they come from? How do people create these constraints? What's the process by which they emerge? And that brings me to the constructionist view of freedom. And so the basic intuition here is that uh, there's a process called social construction. This is an idea that's very popular in sociology and related disciplines that look at culture or sets of beliefs. And a social construction in that view is pretty simple. It simply means something that is true because we believe it to be true, okay? So for example, consider a contract. A contract is only true, but certainly a thing, it's real, but it's only true because we agree it's true. If you and I agree to exchange services for a certain amount of money, uh, that contract is real. But as soon as we decide that the contract is void, it no longer uh, exists, it ceases to exist. And so this basic insight that a lot of things that populate our uh, social lives, like the law, money, science, religion, or social constructions are things that come from our joint belief, our commitment to them, right? They're different than say this table that I'm at or a mountain. These are things that are purely, uh, purely elements of joint belief or joint agreement. Once you realize those are out there, you can ask questions like, where do these beliefs come from? How are they shaped? Who has a role in shaping them? And so the basic idea of social construction theory is that all these things that shape our social world come through interaction. They come through interaction. They come through the media, going to church, going to school, meeting other people on the street and talking about things. And so my argument is that we can use the tools of social construction theory to fruitfully discuss what freedom looks like. What does it mean? Where does it come from? How does it played out? And so in my view, there are three pretty important elements of social construction theory that I want to talk about. One is the creation of a stock of facts. Every community has a stock of facts. It's like a book of all the things they believe to be true. Number two, um, there are framing effects, the interpretation of these facts. And number three, ritual chains, which is just a fancy way of saying, when we meet together and we talk about things and we interact with each other, we transmit ideas, we create new beliefs, and those are pushed through time to the next generation. So let me talk about each of these three ideas in detail before getting to the issue of academic free speech. Uh, so the first idea of the stock of facts that comes from a well-known book in sociology called The Social Construction of Reality, by Peter Berger and uh, Thomas Luckmann. And one of their basic observations was that every community has 
a dictionary, an encyclopedia, a list of facts that they believe to be true. These facts um, come from interaction. As people go through the world, they solve problems, they talk to each other, they live with each other. They agree that some things are true and some things are probably not true. And uh, these are created through interaction and they're real to the people who believe in them, right? So going back to the issue of contracts, a contract is an example of a fact. We can say, you and I, we sign a contract. That's only a convention. It is true only through belief, but it's real and it guides what we do. So if I make a contract, for example, to borrow money from the local bank to uh, purchase a home, then that'll guide my beliefs. I'll get a job and I'll try to earn more money to pay off uh, that loan. And so the basic idea here is that we build up a, a reservoir or a stock of facts or beliefs about the world. And then I think the first application of the simple idea is that some of these ideas can expand or restrict freedom. So if you're in a community and you're interacting with another person, you can develop beliefs about the world, which encourage people to expand or restrict freedom. So let me give you an example of expanding uh, or restricting and then expanding freedom. Uh, an interesting example of the uh, restriction of freedom is the belief in external threats. So if you're in a community and people look around and they say, there's a bad guy out there, there's an external threat to us, he's gonna come get us, then that is something that really encourages people to uh, restrict other people's actions. So once you say there's a threat, then other people go, okay, if there's really a threat, then you don't have that freedom that you had before. One example that's been in my mind recently comes from a 2011 book by Andreas Glazer um, called Political Epistemics, which was a um, historical review of activism in East Germany. So he looked at a socialist state and he asked the question, what did it mean to be an activist to protest the government in East Germany? What did that mean? It's a really interesting book. It's a long kind of dense book of cultural sociology and German history. But there's one section that just jumped out at me when I read it. And he said, when you interview both the activists and the police, the Stasi officers who monitored them and followed them around, they all believed in this worldview that they were in a socialist worker state. So that's fact number one, that they live in a state dedicated to workers. And then number two, this state was in a perpetual uh, stance of warfare against fascists and capitalists. And he, and he wrote in his book that this is a common feature of the culture of many socialist societies. They don't see capitalist societies as an interesting alternative. They don't see capitalism as a you know, tragic, not perfect version of the world that socialism supersedes. No, they see the world of capitalism and the world of markets and liberal democracies as essentially uh, direct threats to them. And in his book, uh, Professor Glazer actually has an interesting picture where he draws uh, like a little castle and he writes East Germany in the middle. And outside the castle, there's like a little devil face, and that devil face is called capitalism. Uh, and to give you a sense of what, what that feels like, I went to Google and found some examples of communist propaganda. This is a picture of Lenin, and it says in Russian, he is sweeping away capitalists and fascists. So this is a really simple example where you say there's an external threat. We grow up in this world where we believe we're in a socialist worker state. There's this thing called capitalism, which is out to destroy us. And people say, look at World War II. They literally invaded us. We're literally under threat. And because of that, I will cooperate with the police in reporting on my neighbors, uh, providing information, spying on them, surveilling them, uh, tolerating the, jail, uh, the jailing of dissenters and so forth. So external threat is, is an example of a social fact, a socially constructed fact that really encourages people to crack down on other people. Then on the other side of things, we can look at examples of external of social facts that encourage freedom. So for example, an interesting finding on, in the literature on racial and ethnic conflict is that uh, unemployment correlates with ethnic conflict. People become a lot more reactionary, more suspicious of outsiders once they believe that they're about to lose their job or that the country is losing money or somehow losing its wealth. And in contrast, Societies where there's a perception of wealth and success tend to actually be a little bit more um, tolerant of uh, minority rights in various ways. So wealth is an interesting social fact that seems to, on the average, encourage more freedom. Framing. Let me briefly talk about framing. This is an idea from Irving Goffman, the social psychologist or psych sociologist. And he said, look, every time that people come together, they have to interpret the situation and interpret the facts. 
And this comes from his 1974 book, Frame Analysis, which is kind of an interesting book to read. And he says things like, for example, if I see you in a room and you're taking notes, I'm probably the teacher, you're probably the student, that framing guides our actions. If I see you on the street, I might treat you differently, right? You're out of the frame, it's a different framing for the interaction and we behave differently. Now, when it comes to politics, this has a very powerful application. And in uh, political sociology, there's an argument that says that all political processes rely on framing. There's a cognitive aspect to all politics. And what uh, David Snow and Jim Benford, or Robert Benford uh, argued in the series of articles, which is that all politics require a cognitive process. And that cognitive process has two parts. The first is the diagnosis of a problem. You point and you say, that's a problem. And then you say, here's my solution, which is voting for me, passing my bill in parliament or in Congress or going to uh, your local congressman and calling them and lobbying. So there's always this one, two aspect of political framing, which is problem identification and a political solution. Here's an example, which I think uh, keeps me up at night. I think this is a fascinating example. You can take the same social fact and frame it in ways that may protect freedom, or you can frame it in a way that restricts freedom and you might have less tolerance. So I think of political violence or what we might call terrorism. And there are two ways that historically the United States government has framed uh, terrorism. Before 9-11, it was framed mainly as a criminal justice issue. So in other words, if uh, you suspected a group of being a terrorist or you had evidence that they committed something really bad or that they were about to, you would normally call law enforcement and law enforcement would use the normal procedures of criminal justice to uh, bring them in and try them. And this is why in previous eras, you saw lots of actual court cases of actual uh, political, uh, uh, politically motivated violent people being put on trial. Uh, then interestingly, after 9-11, we switched to a different framing, which is what do you do with terrorists? You treat them as combatants in a war. And you say, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that the criminal justice system, it is imperfect, but it does have, at least in the US and many other uh, Western democracies, criminal justice systems have some element of protecting your rights. So for example, in the United States, we have the writ of habeas corpus, which means you can't just kidnap somebody keeping them in jail. You have the right to uh, confront your accusers. You have the right to say, what is your evidence against me? You have the right to have your uh, charges tried in public and so forth. And these are all different ways of preserving your freedom, however imperfectly. In contrast, when you say this is a war, all those freedoms go out the door. We're allowed to tell you you can't come to our country because you might be a terrorist. You're not allowed to transmit money between banks without reporting it if you're a terrorist and so forth. There are a lot of things that go out the window that are restricted once you say this is war rather than criminal justice. The third aspect of social construction and freedom that I wanna talk about is the interaction ritual chain. This comes from a book by uh, Randall Collins, who uh, is still alive, he's still with us. He teaches at the University of Pennsylvania. And the idea behind interaction ritual chains is pretty simple, which is society, our, our everyday life is built on small gatherings, like people coming around, talking about things, interacting with each other, getting emotionally invested in each other. And we decide what is true, what is false, what's important, what's not important. And then we agree to recreate the ritual at a later date. So for example, at the beginning of today's presentation for the IEA, uh, Syed was saying that there will be another uh, broadcast this evening and another broadcast next week. That's an example of a ritual chain. A group of people have a shared identity, they come together and they uh, promote that identity and their beliefs and ideals over time. Now, if you look at the cover of the book, I think it's a wonderful uh, book cover of a number of uh, young women at the beach smoking cigarettes. So they all come, they have their cigarette, they all enjoy each other's company and they agree to do it again. Um, so how does this apply to freedom? Well, it applies to freedom because our stock of social facts and our framings all developed in these ritual settings. We come together, we have an emotional investment in the meeting, we look at each other, and then we talk and we interact. And the example I want to talk about to really hammer this home is uh, the debate over the use of police force. In the United States and in other countries, there's been a debate over the last, say, five or 10 years about what is appropriate for the police to do when they interact with you, right? And so people will say, look at, you know, the Constitution. Don't we have rights? Or look at this law or that law. And I would argue, yes, that's important. But the, uh, the real issue is in small gatherings, when people who are involved in defining what's appropriate police conduct 
what did they say is appropriate? What did they decide on? How they transmit that to others in uh, these small group uh, meetings? This would include things like traffic stops. So for example, if two police officers pull you over and give you a speeding ticket, and one officer is rough or mean to you, the other officer could say, hey, that you went over the line, or the other officer could say, okay, that's great, right? So right there, that's an example of a ritual chain that's reproduced over time. You can think about court trials. So if I accuse a police officer, then the judge and the attorneys and me and my attorney would all argue about what's appropriate. We can think about law school seminars where they hash out the theory of what's appropriate and so forth. And just to give you a sense of how utterly uh, serious this is, I provided an image, this is from the news, of a public hearing, this is the city council hearing of Ferguson, Missouri, where Michael Brown, a resident of Ferguson, was shot by a police officer, and that led to a riots and unrest, and led to a lot of kind of policy change in the United States. And this meeting is literally the meeting where the city council listened to transcripts of uh, police officers on the radio talking about the incident, and they were trying to decide whether the use of force was justified in that moment or not. So the lesson here is that, yes, the Constitution is great, the Magna Carta is great, all these things are great. But on the other hand, you have to really say, how does it play out in the ground? And it's these small group meetings where people come together and they interact with each other and they learn what the meaning of something is. And that is where a lot of this action happens. So if we have a few minutes, uh, I think I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about free speech uh, disputes. Um, I think they're very interesting because they raise a lot of the issues that I spoke about and keeping an eye on time. Uh, and so this is a picture of Charles Murray, the uh, conservative or libertarian um, you know, writer and scholar. And this is a picture of him at Middlebury College. Uh, viewers in the UK may not know this, but he gave a talk at Middlebury College that actually turned violent protesters actually came up on stage, uh, which is actually kind of typical for Charles Murray, but it got even worse that as he was leaving the auditorium later, there was actually a fight, and one of the uh, professors was actually injured. Ironically, a progressive professor, uh, she tried to intervene and her arm was broken. Um, and so in the U.S., we have these incidents. I would presume that, you know, they happen in other places as well, where people really feel uh, they need to stop other people from speaking or to interrupt them from speaking. And so we can ask, you know, what is the social environment where this happens? What kind of processes do these disputes reflect? So uh, let's just go through. So for example, you can say, what are the stock of facts on campus regarding speech? So for example, most universities have uh, lots of rules about what is proper speech, what you can and can't say and how you say it. Uh, some are very obvious. So for example, if you're teaching a class on French, you cannot just go into a lecture on calculus or physics or chemistry. Uh, things are very rigidly segmented by topic. Then there are other rules uh, that people know that are facts on the ground, which are a little bit more ambiguous. So if you're in a sociology class and you're talking about racial differences, you know, there is ambiguity about what you can and can't say, and that leads to a lot of conflict. People don't know what's appropriate and not appropriate. And one way to resolve this that some campuses have actually instituted is the free speech zone. So they said, okay, on our campus, what we're doing is if something is really contentious, we're gonna move it from the classroom to an actual section on campus. And literally there are campuses in the US where there's a sign that says free speech zone, where you can actually say what you want as opposed to the classroom. And that's their fact. They said, this is, this is the way this campus is organized. You have to deal with that. So that tells you a little bit about kind of the range of issues that there are ambiguities about what you can and can't say there are jurisdictions that allow more and less free speech. Um, framings also matter as well. So for example, one thing that you discover is when you get contentious speech like Charles Murray, that some people uh, see it in very different ways. For example, you could say um, uh, controversial opinions, unpopular opinions are threats. And this is an argument that's often uh, advocated by people who want to restrict speech on campus, they say, well, you know, free speech is good unless it's a threat. Remember our idea of external threats. And so a common theme that people say is that, you know, your scholarship or your opinion is an implicit or an explicit threat to my ethnic group or my minority. Uh, that's a common argument. Uh, another argument is that it's basically racism or bigotry under academic guise, and that's not permitted. So that's one way of taking the speaker and framing them such that uh, you restrict uh, freedom. 
Then on the other hand, other campuses go in the other direction and they try to reframe campus speech as a normal part of the operation. And so this illustration is from something called the Report of the Committee on Freedom of Expression at the University of Chicago. And you can read it, it's a short statement. I recommend that you read it. And it's very simple, it just says, you know, we're not gonna tolerate bigotry or slurs or that sort of thing. We're not gonna tolerate the incitement to violence or other illegal activities. But we do understand that controversial opinions are important. We're not gonna shout you down. And if you say it in a scholarly way, we'll support your uh, right uh, to say it on campus. And so this is an example of where framing or interpreting things can push you in a direction towards more freedom or less freedom. Uh, there are also lots of rituals around uh, speech on campus that bear mentioning that uh, relate to how much freedom you have. So for example, uh, administrators will routinely sit and uh, meet and talk about what's happening on their campus. And they'll say, was it good or bad for this campus group to, to bring this student out? What are the issues that get raised? And those administrators will then create their own set of facts that they use to regulate students. And already after this wave of free speech incidents on campus, universities are now developing new social facts or new rules about uh, what is permissible or not permissible on campus. Sometimes the rituals around speech actually happen outside of the campus. So for example, many uh, conservative news sources will periodically run an article that says, look at those hypocrites uh, in, on the campus, they're tenured radicals, how it's really bad that they're saying what they're saying, right? Or they're hypocrites for not allowing more conservative speech or something like that. And so that itself is an example of a ritual. Every couple of months, uh, National Review or some other conservative website will run an article saying how bad these evil tenured radicals are, and that continues over time and promotes a certain kind of belief about universities. Um, for my money, I think one of the most interesting people to trigger all these uh, complexities around uh, academic free speech is a guy named um, uh, Milo Yiannopoulos. Uh, I don't know if you have him in the UK, but we have him in the US, and Milo is a controversial figure who loves controversy uh, I think of him more as a provocateur or performance artist rather than a public speaker, but still he's an example of somebody who understands these facts, these socially constructed facts on campus, and then uses them for his own uh, purposes. This is a picture of him um, at a, a college in the United States, and he's holding a sign that says feminism is cancer. So he definitely knows how to really poke people in the eye and make them react. So we can then go through this kind of constructionist view of like, what is Milo doing, right? So first of all, one of the um, things that colleges like to say is that they're a platform for debate. Colleges often like to offer this, even though they don't think through it completely, they do offer the option. And so he says, okay, if there's a platform for debate and students can invite speakers, please invite me. I would love to debate and uh, generate some publicity for my, uh, for my cause. Um, number two, framing, right? So after people get upset, uh, he could frame it. He could say, this is an interesting case. Why are you upset at me? But rather, uh, Milo likes framing it as a um, issue of hypocrisy and intolerance, where people get upset at him and uh, people protest him. He says, look, there it is. And then the ritual chain is that he does this over and over. He shows up at a campus, um, takes the invitation to speak or invites himself in some cases, uh, creates this negative framing and then takes it to the media and that becomes part of a ritual chain where people repeat this over and over and over and they come to an understanding that something very bad is happening at the university because their friend Milo is not allowed to speak. All right, so I definitely want to open this up to Q&A and, question, uh, Q &A and questions. Let me just summarize. So freedom is a two-sided thing. So you need the ability to act and people need to uh, tolerate you or to not interfere with what your actions are. Um, this uh, belief about tolerance comes from what people believe are the facts, how they're framed, and gatherings where people hash out uh, what freedom means in that particular community, and that this is a particularly interesting way of thinking about freedom, and uh, you can use it to study specific cases of tolerance or intolerance, such as campus speech disputes. And before we go to q and I want to thank everybody, Stephen Davies, Christina, Syed, and Jack for making this possible. And I would have been here in person to meet you all and shake your hand. However, that's not possible, but the Institute for Humane Studies also was going to put some funding in to make that happen. Maybe I'll meet you next year. Uh, and so thank you to everybody for supporting this and let's go to the Q&A.
Well, thank you for watching. I thought Fabio raised some interesting points, especially about how we define freedom and how some people seek to impose limits in opposition to voices with which they may disagree. For more details of our content online, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, IA London, follow our podcasts at uh, Podbean, and visit our website at www.ia.org.uk. Thank you for watching.